while we're in this um, mode right here, we had sang hallelujahs to the to the Lord, and we know that that brings the angel armies. I wanted to bring this to your attention. Is um, just many of you were here when Andrew came and talked to us about four kids. And if you don't know, then I'll tell you that four kids is a it is an initiative here in Broward County in South Florida that um, to activate every church to take at least one child. And if every church, if a member in every church would adopt one child, we would have no more need for the system. All of them would be taken in. And so this, this weekend is an important weekend for them because they're going into all of the all of the local churches that um and they're asking them for support they're asking them to support them in and prayer and just you know are you one of the ones that are called to take a child they're asking them to give they're asking them for prayer warriors but um andrew sent me this and he said we are asking for serious prayer co coverage this weekend there have been many fiery darts thrown at us, as well as some of the brothers and sisters at Calvary. Um, Calvary Chapel was the one who initiated this um, because they were aware of the system, and every time they tried to work with the system, the system is broken. And so they just said, let us help you. And it, it became to be so successful with their help that now they look to them and they ask them to be a part. So it's also breaking down inner to interdenominational so that there's no more denominations when you're caring for a child. And so it, that makes Jesus happy. And so we all have heart for kids. And so he said, um, the enemy is not happy. And what I do know, because he had also called me, is that um, people ha had ended up going to the hospital that were major major players of presentation this weekend. So they can't even present. So then they had to bring in other people to help them because they were under attack. And so he's he's crying out for this and he's asking for God to do something miraculous um, today. And so we're going to take that initiative up right now and, and just pray. We have called forth and praised God's name, so we know he's here, and we know the angels are here to war. And so um, we know that James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep themselves unspotted from the world. So, Father, right now we just come together. Pray with me. Pray however you pray, Lord, for the for the children and the orphans. Lord, we come and we just thank you for this initiative in South Florida. We thank you that we get to be a part of this, God. We thank you, Lord, that you're doing so many things by this, Lord. You care so much for the people. You care so much for the children. You care so much. You don't want one of them to be motherless or fatherless, Lord. And so we bring this initiative before you, Lord, and we thank you that whoever has had to step in, they are the most anointed today. They won't even know what happened to them, Lord, because your presence will be on them and your presence is on this. This is your word. And so we lift it before you, Lord. We ask that you watch over it, that you, that you call people's hearts forward. Lord, whether they're supposed to pray, whether they're supposed to give, whether they're supposed to take in a child, Lord, we call them forth into their proper position according to your perfect will right now. Lord, we thank you for foster families. We thank you for adoption. We thank you for money overflowing. And so, God, we thank you that you are in charge of this, but we submit this before you today with full expectancy that you are hearing and answering these prayers for these kids. Lord, I pray that the Broward County in South Florida and the rest of the United States and all over the world, people will begin to see the needs of children and respond to it. Lord, we thank you that this is just one place that is doing this, Lord, but we would ask that you would wipe out the need, Lord, for children to have someone who totally loves them, that accepts them, that will not harm them in any way. So, Lord, we thank you for answering these prayers. We know we pray according to your will. 
and we thank you for it, Lord. I lift up all of the all of the leaders of for him, Lord. I I thank you, Lord, for kids, Lord. I thank you for that. I thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you that you're you're going to have the end result that you desire today, Lord. This is your heart. You said so. This is your heart. And so we agree with your heart, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Uh, come on, Eric. Thank you for agreeing with that. I know they're all going to be very happy that we did that. I promised them that we would. Now, good morning, friends. All right, quickly, I want to go over the announcements and our uh, scripture and prayer and declaration, and then take our offering. And then we have a very special guest, very special to me, and to Cindy. And because to Cindy, to all of you. <laughs> um, so let me get, let me go through these announcements tonight. Here at the church at 6 o'clock, the King's Men are meeting. And if you want more information about that, then see Jeff after the service. Jeff is standing in the back. You can't miss him. So if you want to talk to him and have more information about what's going to happen tonight, um, see him after the service. And that's at 6 o'clock right here. And then this week, we have uh, prayer opportunities all week. Tuesday night is our prayer by phone from 5.30 to 6.30. And the number to dial in and the access code are in your bulletin. Did everybody get a bulletin today? Good. And all of you are familiar with that anyway. I know Cindy has that dial in on her speed dial. <laughs> um, and then Friday is family prayer from 10 to 12. That's here at the church. Wednesday... <clears throat> Every Wednesday, our class is here on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. We are currently studying the book of Ephesians, and there's child care provided for that. So come with your whole family and enjoy the, the study that we're doing on the book of Ephesians. Friday, the Limitless Youth are meeting at 7.30 right here at the church also. And if you want more information about that, find any of the youth that are here today or Steve and Janice, or any of the youth helpers, Jonathan or Jonathan, or who, am I leaving anyone out? Mariella. Mariella has all the information that you will need. <laughs> um, in June, uh, looking ahead to June, on June 2nd, we're going to start our Connect classes again. So that will, there is a sign-up sheet. Uh, out at the greeter station when you come in the door. So um, if you want to be a part of that, um, you're welcome to be a part of it. Okay, let's do our scripture and our prayer and declaration. Will you all read with me? John 6, 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. We thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you that because he was crucified and raised from the dead, we can be forgiven and have eternal life. We pray that all men would come to believe and trust you for salvation and have eternal life. We praise you, Father, for your promise to forgive us, to save us, and to raise us up at the last day. Amen. Amen. Apologize for the delay. <laughs> okay, for my uh, for the offering, uh, I want to share with you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, you remember that Pastor Don mentioned that as Christians. We're really in a battle. And, and, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 2 
and verse, verses 3 and 4 tell us a little bit about that, and I'll read that for you. Paul says to Timothy, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say that soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For then if they do get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, they can't please their commanding officer. Now we know that Jesus, our commanding officer, is pleased when we are soldiers for him. Now, I know I have never, I'm not a veteran. I was never in the armed forces, but I understand this about veterans, and you you veterans, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But you wait, if you're a, a soldier or a marine or an airman or a coast guardsman or a sailor, any one of the armed forces, you view life differently. You you're not caught up in the affairs of what the civilians are doing back home. You are, like we talked about the last two weeks, you are vigilant and you are diligent. Isn't that right? You veterans, you tell me if I'm wrong, but you, when you come back and you become a civilian after you've been in the military, you view life differently than when you were in the military. Isn't that, is that true, Duffy? Duffy, what? Yeah, that's right. You think about things differently when you're in the military. I think that the church needs to have a little tougher attitude, like what Pastor Don preached a couple weeks ago. I think we need to be a little tougher and view ourselves as part of the army of God. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. And the, the scripture says that the weapons of our warfare, and I'm not talking about bullets and guns and bombs. I'm talking about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now, the other thing that the military does is they train with their weapons right? I think oftentimes, I know it's true in my own life. I, t I don't view myself as being in God's military. I think that maybe somehow I'm in the reserves. I can serve one weekend a month and, you know, or that I am retired, you know, retired. But that isn't the case for all of us who are in God's army. We need to train every day with the weapons of our warfare, like John was saying this morning, and John and I didn't talk at all, but making war in the heavenlies is a spiritual battle. And one of the ways that we engage in our spiritual battle is through our tithes and, tithes and offering. You know that uh, that's one of the ways that we train with our weapons also. Our tithe and offering is a spiritual weapon, whether you realize it or not. You get stirred up in your spirit when you give your tithes and offerings. And you are doing damage to the enemy when you give your tithes and offerings. I have never viewed it like that before. But it is true. And I'm going to start viewing it like that from now on. That I'm engaging in, in spiritual warfare when I give my tithes and offerings. Okay, so this morning, as you give your tithes and offerings, think about being, part, being a soldier for Jesus, being a Marine or being an airman or a Coast Guardsman or a sailor, whatever your area of service was. You think of yourself in that regard this morning. And don't, let it just, don't just be a weekend warrior. Don't just be in the reserves. Be in God's army every day. Practice with your spiritual weapons every day. Okay? You all agree with me to do that? Okay, say, I agree to do that. All right. Okay, ushers, would you please wait on the people? And I'll be done talking. But while they're, can I introduce them while, or do you want to introduce? You, you? Okay. Can we do it together? Okay. You go ahead. Okay, and then you say what you want. We love them so much, we have to both do it. Okay, so um, this is Cindy's mom and dad. So they're like our family too then. Okay, so um, some of you know and some of you don't that the Taylor family and, and specifically Cindy and Eric prayed liberty into being. Like they were praying for a church to, to come to life in uh, this area and we were it. 
And so as soon as they knew that we were going to open a church, they joined us and they've been here since day one. Actually before day one, huh, Cindy? So, um, so that was really good. But then we got to know these beautiful people and my life has been so impacted by them. I have met with them personally and now they've been with us a few months. We never want them to go, but they are insisting on going back and completing their mission in Indonesia. But um, they told us a little bit about it, their life the last time that they had a chance to talk and to introduce themselves. And so we know that they have impacted Indonesia and um, I'll let you say all the technical things about them. I just wanna tell you about how lovely they are. So whenever you're around them, they, um, they love God so much that it makes you love God more. They, and they're so gentle and kind, they accept every single person. I can't tell, every time I preach, they have something good to say to me about what I said, which, it blows me away that people of this caliber would even find anything good. And so I am very honored and blessed to know you, and it is a privilege for us to have you here in this, in this place, in our church, speaking to all of us and stirring up the gifts that we know are need to be stirred up, and I'm believing for great things to happen because of it. So, so thank you for serving us. And being with us. Okay, Eric, you can talk. Did I take it all? No, no. Okay. You, you're you're great. And I just <laughs> want to say how I mean, I was their first son-in-law. <laughs> yes. They have three daughters. Aww. And Cindy and I were the she's not the oldest, but we were the first to get married. Aww. Of the three daughters. So I was the I I called myself at the time, I was the only son-in-law. Wow. I was the son they never had. There you go. But I want to, uh, listen, they have been such a blessing in my life. You can't imagine all the stories I've heard and tried to retell inadequately, but um, John and Helen Ellenberger, I don't, I call them mom and dad. Yeah, you know, that's good. I don't call them my in-laws. I call them my, my parents, Aww. my uh, mom and dad or grandma and grandpa <laughs> around our kids. But um, we're honored to, to have you here. We're honored. I'm honored to have you in my life. Thank you for letting me marry Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. For giving us your blessing. Yeah. And John and Helen, come and minister to us about what you're doing. I've heard these stories before, oh. and I love hearing them every time. I'm going to tell him that. What? He translated the New Testament. Okay. Found that. Did you bring this up? I did. Okay. Okay, John and Helen have been involved in the translation work into a tribal language in Indonesia for how many years? Over 50. 62 years. The <laughs> Mind new, blown. <laughs> yes. Now, they won't tell you all these details, right. but this tribal language... Had, when they went there in 1957, this tribal group had no written language. John and Helen did not know their language. Can you imagine? They had to learn their language by holding objects up and listening to what the people said that was, and then phonetically writing it down John is a linguist, so he knows how to do all that stuff. I wouldn't have had a clue. I would have, I mean, uh, I would have starved. <laughs> but so then he had, to dis he had to learn their language and then give them an alphabet and then teach them to read their own alphabet and then translate the New Testament and the Old Testament. The New Testament has been completed Yes. And they're currently working on the Old Testament, but it is a long process, 62-year-long process so far, and they're not done yet. Almost. That's why they're going back. They're almost done. And we just uh, want to bless them. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for your diligence and your vigilance. Yes. <laughs> Amen. And your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. See, aren't you glad he, I made him tell you all of that? Because he said it so good. Come, please. Bless you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank you for the times of worship and praise and fellowship that we have had with you these months that we've been with Cindy and Eric. We thank you for the opportunity today to tell about our ministry. We worked in the province of Papua in Indonesia, which is in the South Pacific. When we tell where we are, people always say, where is that? <laughs> you can look it up on a map. <laughs> there's a map in the front. Yes, there's a map over there. We've been working with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the CMA, in Papua, Indonesia. That's the western part of the island of New Guinea. There are 307 tribes on that half of the island. The other half of the island, John will tell you about maybe, has many more. 530. So on the whole island of New Guinea, the eastern and the western part, there's one sixth of all the languages in the world. But we only worked with one of them. <laughs> we worked with the Damal tribe. John always says, say it right, don't say the damn owls. It doesn't sound right. <laughs> but call them the Damals. It's not a big tribe. It's surrounded by a lot bigger tribes, several bigger tribes. But it is the most friendly, receiving, accepting tribe. And so God knew what he was doing when he sent us there. <clears throat> because they were the first tribe to really listen and receive. And when they received the Lord, the neighboring tribes said, what are they doing? They're gonna, they're gonna get sick, they're gonna die, they're gonna, their wives are gonna be barren, they're gonna lose in war. Everything bad is gonna to happen to them. Even their pigs won't, won't bear little piglets, or their pigs will die. But God was there. Amen. In the first two years after they turned to the Lord, not a single adult death occurred in that group. And the people around were watching. And then they began to turn and believe too. They have a very different way of saying hello. They don't just shake hands, they finger snap. And John will show you how. The one person sticks out his index finger curled like that, and the other person takes two fingers and grabs it, and then you snap twice and then you shake hands oh, wow. and as you do that you say amolo and amolo means i love you isn't that beautiful amolo so you go snap twice and then you shake and you say amolo 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 now try that with your neighbor okay <laughs> one sticks out an index finger and tell them amolo or if you can't remember that, say, I love you. <laughs> we have I love you. Isn't that beautiful? We learned how to say, Hello, I love you. Right off, first thing. We did have some problems though. I have long hair, not very long, but long hair like they're men. And, they're men. and John has short hair like they're women. 
So one of the first questions they asked was, which one of you is the man? So I thought I would show them by wearing a hairnet. Every man wears a hairnet over all that hair. So I wore a hairnet. And the other thing they do, uh, in addition to the hairnet, is they wear a pig's tusk through their nose. Oh, nice. Did you do that too? Uh, I tried that, but I don't have a hole in there. So I'd put the pig's tusk up here. There, that. Now, are you a man? Do you, do you have a hole in your nose? <laughs> now, uh, the women, uh, they don't wear a hairnet, but they wear a net down their back, like that. And that's because they've got to carry all the sweet potatoes and all the heavy stuff. The women are the beasts of burden of the Damal tribe. And if you have a baby, you have another net, and you put the baby on top of all the sweet potatoes, and you carry that. So the, the men have it easy over there. <laughs> I suppose I can take this off here. Isn't that right? Now, I want to talk to you today about the kingdom of God and kingdom of God priorities. I want to tell you how the Damal tribe came into the kingdom of God and what Jesus says to you and me about that. Now, the Damals now know what that means, but what are kingdom priorities for you and for me? And so uh, we want to read first Acts chapter 1, verses 6 uh, through 9. Uh, let's read it together, shall we? Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? All right. Uh, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, now, uh, oh, let, let's read verse 9. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. All right, uh, we'll do a couple of verses in a few minutes. Now, these are the last words of Jesus before he returned to heaven. Uh, last words are always important words. We had, uh, we lived uh, three miles from the airstrip and people would come and visit us. And before they left us to go back to get their plane, we would say, be careful about the log bridge that you have to pass to get to the airstrip. Be careful. Now, last words are important for parents to their children. Uh, send them off to school. And now, now remember, be careful to do this. Last words. How many of you remember 9-11 and the World Trade Center? You can't forget where you were then, do you? Uh, on flight Number 93 was a Christian and Missionary Alliance uh, uh, fellow churchman uh, from, from New Jersey. He was on that plane. And when the terrorists took over the plane, he rallied some of his friends by getting them on his phone. And he also had his family back home listening. And uh, his last words were, ready, all right, 
Let's roll. Come on, guys. Let's roll. And let's roll has become a rallying cry for anti-terrorism in the United States today. I think these words are like let's roll from Jesus. They're a rallying cry to all of us, and they are his last words. Now, that plane didn't go crash into the Pentagon like the terrorists were going to have it done. They, they took the plane over, and it crashed in Pennsylvania. But his last words became a rallying cry. Now, the last words of Jesus are priorities to live by. They're not just good last words. They are priorities to live by until Jesus comes. Now, I think Jesus gives us in these two verses three priorities to live by. The first one, uh, no, before we get to the first one, they came out of <clears throat> verse 6. Now, verse 6 was a question by the disciples. Jesus had been with them for 40 days, and they had interacted with him. They knew he was raised again, and they knew he was leaving them. I think they know he's going to leave them. And they say to Jesus, Jesus, we have one question before you go. And here's the question. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, for the Jews, that's a political question, isn't it? The Romans controlled Israel. They were probably standing there where they could see the city of, of Jerusalem in front of them. And they said, Jesus, before you go, tell us, what's going to happen? What is going to happen politically in this country? We are anxious to know. Now, Jesus' answer was a very important answer. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. That's priority number one. Jesus said uh, to them, don't worry about the future. The future is in God's hand. Now, seek, there, there are a couple of things here that he was telling them. He's saying, uh, the kingdom of God is what's most important. The kingdom of this world is not that important. You choose first the kingdom of God. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 6. And verse 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. If you seek first the kingdom of God, all of that other stuff, is gonna, God's going to take care of that. Do you seek first the kingdom of God? What about your time allocations in the day? Does Jesus come first? Does the kingdom of God come first? That's what Jesus is saying here. Um, now, the second verse is 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Jesus, uh, Paul, Peter reflects on this. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You can leave it all with God. Because he's in control and he loves you and he cares for you. Now, uh, the Damals, the people that we went to work with, the Damals were controlled by fear. They were afraid of the evil spirits that would come and make them sick. They were afraid of the ancestor spirits that controlled everything else and would um, 
make their enemies come and be at war with them and do all kinds of other things if they didn't do it right. And what was doing it right? They had to make pork sacrifices to the evil spirits and the ancestral spirits. And they were in constant fear for their lives, for their against illness, and, and for their well-being. So they were living in constant spirit appeasement, doing pig sacrifices. Now, uh, that was fear-driven. In 1956, two missionaries, Don Gibbons and Gordon Larson, walked two weeks into that area. They were attacked and driven away, and they said, well, we're going to come back. They came back, and they said, now, you can do what you want, but we're here to stay. And they said, okay, we'll let you stay. And so uh, there were two big tribes there, the Damals and the Donis. And uh, one, Gordon, went with the Donis, and Don stayed with the Damals. And Don went from village to village, learning their language and telling them, don't fear the evil spirits. Jesus is more powerful than the evil spirits. Pray to Jesus. Now, after six months of this message, uh, they were very interested because they had grown up believing that they once had eternal life. And then they lost that eternal life because of a wrong judgment of an ancestor. And they believed that somebody someday was going to come back and tell them, how to gain eternal life again. When Don Gibbons told them, believe in Jesus, they said, here it is. After six months of hearing this message, the big chief, Den, maybe we have a picture of Den. Uh, the big chief came uh, to Don Gibbons and said, we have heard about Jesus and we want to become followers of Jesus. Don told them, if you want to be followers of Jesus, you have to leave your spirit appeasement, your sacrifices to the ancestors. This is big chief Den. He came to Don and he said, we have talked about it and we want to follow Jesus. So the next day, they gathered all of the Damals together in that one area. There were 300 on a Sunday morning in this village. And he had told them, you have to get rid of all of your spirit and ancestor appeasement. All the charms and fetishes. Den stood up and he said, I'm going to follow Jesus. How many of you, my people, will follow Jesus with me. Among 300 there that day, 200 stood up. And they went into the sacred areas of the men's house. The men all live in one house and the families live in other houses. They went into the men's house and they brought out these sacred items. Women had never seen them before. And they lifted them up, opened them up, called the name of the evil spirit and the ancestral spirit, built a big bonfire and threw them into the fire. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People stood on the other side and said, don't do it. They'll get you. You'll get sick. You'll die. And as Helen mentioned, for two years after that, not a single adult died. It was a demonstration that God was in control. So uh, that, that was uh, priority, uh, priority number one. Number one. Uh, 
Um, uh, okay. So <clears throat> he burned his charms and fetishes, and then he went into the sacred grove. These were trees planted for the ancestors. And he cut down the ancestor trees, cut them all down. People were standing on the other side and said, they'll kill you, don't do it. But he said, we're followers of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and he will take care of all that other stuff. You don't have to be afraid. Don't live by fear. Okay, that's priority number one. Priority number two is in, ver in the next verse, he says, uh, uh, verse 8, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Okay? He says, be filled with the Spirit of God. You will receive God's power. That's priority number two. Priority number two is focus on spiritual power. Now, uh, he said to them, don't do anything until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't do anything in your own power. Don't try to witness. Don't do anything until you're filled with the power of God. Um, now, uh, their power lay in bows and arrows. Uh, after they'd given their hearts to Jesus, one day Big Chief Den came and, and he said, thin, thin man, that's what they called me. Uh, thin man, uh, is it all right for us believers in Jesus to shoot people and kill them? I said, well, you know the answer to that. I said, God loves people. He doesn't want you to kill them. He says, well, we know that. And now every man wore as part of their dress a bow and arrow. You didn't go out of the house. You didn't go anywhere without taking your bow and arrow. Because you were always ready to fight. Always ready to kill. Uh, he says, if we keep using these bows and arrows, we're going to kill somebody. He said, we've decided that as followers of Jesus, we're going to burn our bows and arrows. I said, oh my goodness. I said, now your Donny neighbors, this other tribe, are in a warfare right down below us, right down here. I says, they will hear that you've burned your bows and arrows and they will destroy you. I said, I don't think that's a good idea. He was a great big guy. Then put his arm around me. He says, thin man, we've decided to burn our bows and arrows and we don't care what you think. <laughs> I says, okay. okay. He says, and we're going to do it tomorrow. And we want you to be there and see it. I said, Jesus will take care of you. And I will be there and watch. Good. Okay. So the next day I was there. They took their bows. They went into the houses, the men's house, and got all of these bows and arrows and brought them out. And they lit a big bonfire and began to burn them. Now, part of that bonfire is in this next picture. You can see the, the bows and arrows burning up. Uh, this is just part of them as the Christians watched. There were Donnie neighbors there and they saw it and they knew that they had no bows and arrows. They could not defend themselves. That coming Sunday, we were seated in the uh, churchyard. They didn't have a church building. We were seated in the churchyard doing Sunday church. And Big Chief Den placed two lookouts.
to watch the war going on below so that if anything different happened, they could let us know. We were praying and uh, going on and, and praising God. And in the middle of the service, the two watchmen cried out, they've just sent a war party up here to attack us. Big Chief Dan stood up and took over. He, he got some young men together and he said, now you're going to go down and, and intercept them and keep them from attacking us. Now, how was that going to be? They didn't have any weapons. All these guys were coming with bows and arrows and spears. Uh, and he said, Thin Man, you stay here and pray with the women. Uh, he knew I would be no good on the battlefield. <laughs> uh, so they went down there. And, and you know, we were, we were really praying because <laughs> there were a lot more Donnies than there were Damals. And uh, they had warred against the Damals before and taken over their, their land. Um, so these, the, the group from the Christians went down and the warring group had to cross through a river before they came up into our area. And as the Christian group got behind them and as they passed through the river, which was heavily wooded and they couldn't be seen, they came in behind them and attacked them from behind, took away their bows and arrows, uh, broke them right in front of them. Spears, bows and arrows, they broke them, gave them a kick while well, they didn't have pants in the seat of their pig grease. And, uh, and they said, now don't attack us. We are followers of Jesus. Now, those warriors turned around and they said, wow. You know, it's because they are Christians that they didn't kill us because anybody else would have taken our bows and arrows and then killed us. Yeah. Within three to five months, those same warriors amongst the Donnies gave their hearts to Jesus and became followers of him. What, what is the power? Holy Spirit power. It's not guns it's not bows and arrows. It's not spears. It's God's power. Hallelujah. Now, uh, now we are, there's the power of, of illness and healing was one of the things that drove them by fear. Now they were saying, don't fear, pray to God. And in prayer, they were, we were praying many times for God to heal people that were really sick. Now, the Damal Church uh, appointed elders, brand new elders. These were the first elders they'd had. And they didn't have a lot of background. They didn't have much teaching, but they were now the new leaders. Uh, one of the new elders and I uh, went to go to a, the next valley. It took about four hours walk to get there. And we walked through Adani village on the way. Uh, as we walked through that village, why uh, a man called out from the men's house, will you pray for my son? We stopped and he came out of the men's house, bearing this little boy, about a year and a half old, beautiful little boy. And as he came, he turned him over on his back so that we could see what needed prayer. On the end of his spine was a little tail, about an inch and a half long. Now, I, did, I didn't know what it was, but I knew that it was the spinal cord all jammed up down there and that it was really serious. It's called spina bifida. And it's, 
it's operated on in the United States because it's life-threatening. I said, ooh, that kid is really sick. And the new elder right next to me, before he could, I could say anything more, he says, we'll pray for him. Jesus can heal him. Hey, he had more faith than I did. No, I believe that God could heal him, but uh, I was still getting there. Uh, we laid our hands on this little boy and prayed that God would show his power and heal him. We went on uh, to the valley, and it was two weeks before we got back to this through this village again. I was with the same elder, and we said, oh, this is the village where we prayed for that little boy. How's the little boy? We called into the men's house. The father came out carrying his little boy again, turned him over so that we could see him. There was no tail visible. There was a little swirl where it had disappeared. God takes care of our need for power so that there is no fear. And for the Damals, it took care of all of their fear. Uh, okay. Now, priority number three. This is in that uh, verse 8b. He says, You will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, uh, you, people usually say this means uh, you're going to witness for Jesus near and far to the ends of the earth. I think that's what it means too. Uh, but I want to add some uh, I want to add some additional meaning to this as the, it developed amongst the Damals. Uh, the first is Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a big city. And Damals are seeing cities now for the first time. There's a big American mining company mining the largest known gold reserves in the world right in the middle of Damal country. And there are two cities now in Damal country amongst uh, these miners. City culture has slammed the Damals. And you know what, it was with, what it's with. Drinking, drugs, porno, free sex, AIDS. They've got everything. Let me tell you about one young man. His name was Doni Alom. His father was the first Bible translator. And his son, because of contact in the big city, became a drunkard. Um, one day I was visiting there uh, a couple of years later, and Doni grabbed my hand. He says, uh, I want to show you what I used to be. And he took me down to a corner in the city where there were about 20 of these drunks on a street corner, and they would harass people as they went by, demand money from them, and if they didn't give them money, they would beat them up. So it was really bad. Uh, Doni had become a drunk and was there every evening beating people up and demanding money. Uh, he tried to get away from it, but he couldn't. Drunkenness had just slammed him. Um, one day, a worker, a Christian worker in the mine, came and said, Doni, you don't have to be like this. Jesus can help you. And he said, follow me. And he took Doni to a youth meeting that was going on that evening. And at that youth meeting, Doni gave his life to Jesus and received Holy Spirit power 
to control the drunkenness. I want to tell you that Donny today is a pastor in a new church called New Jerusalem Church. And it's bringing, it emphasizes young people ministry. And it's bringing people who had the same problems that Doné had to the Lord Jesus. That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is today's culture. And the next is Judea. Uh, Judea was the whole area. It's your neighbors. Uh, there, the Damal's neighbors were Donnies. These ones that made war with them. Big Chief Din had four wives. His fourth wife, her father was the biggest Donny chief in the valley. I said to Din, Din, are you telling your father-in-law about Jesus? And Din looked at me and he said, what? Tell the Donnies about Jesus? He says, they're not real people. They're like dogs. They don't have souls. They can't believe. They, they hated them because they had moved in and taken their, uh, made war with them and taken over their land. Uh, they hated the Donnies. I said, Dan, you tell your father-in-law about Jesus and they will follow Jesus too. He told his father-in-law about Jesus and within months, his father-in-law was the first Donnie to believe in Jesus. There are probably 2,000 Donnies in the Alaga Valley where that was, and they have area after area heard the word of God and turned to Christ as well. So it is your closest neighbor. <laughs> yes, tell your neighbors about Jesus. Uh, I, uh, they, they went to the Donnies and the Donnies uh, in the Ilaga said, oh, well, we've got relatives in other valleys. There were 10 to 12 other valleys. They went from valley to valley tell, telling about Jesus. And I want to tell you that about 250,000 to 300,000 Donnies have come to Christ as well. Hallelujah. And it all began with the big chief's father-in-law who did have a soul and could follow Jesus. And then there's the ends of the earth. There were the other tribes. Tribes that were near neighbors and the Damals went to all the Damals, told them about Jesus, and then went to their neighbors, the Indugas, the Dems, the Wanos, and the Turu. Uh, the Turu, they didn't even know they were out there. They were strange people. We've got a picture of a Turu tribesman who was the first one to hear about the gospel. And he came walking about 10 days' walk from his valley to see the to inspect the Damals and see if they really were did have the kind of power that they were talking about. Uh, these Tudu people were strange looking, and we'll get it up on the uh, picture overhead uh, soon. Okay, now there's one more. Yeah, there's the Tudu. You see his. His head uh, has a big uh, pointed hat on, uh, very strange, far away. And the Tudu people came to Christ after hearing from the Damals. Hallelujah. Okay, then there's the ends of the earth, other tribes. Now, there's one of these four that I didn't mention, and that's Samaritans. Who are the Samaritans? Do you know who the Samaritans are? Well, 
The Samaritans were a different people group in, in Israel. They had a different religion, a different language, a different culture. The Jews hated them. They lived north of Judea there, and Jews would walk across the, the river and go up the other side to not walk through Samaria because they didn't want to contact them. And yet, in John chapter 4, it said, Jesus said he had to go through Samaria. Jesus was going to go through Samaria. Why? Because there was a woman at the well. And remember, the disciples came back and saw Jesus talking to this woman at the well. And they said, what are you talking to her for? They hated the Samaritans. Samaritans are people that don't like you and probably you don't like them. And yet Jesus says, you're responsible to be a witness to them. Um, I want to say who the Samaritans were uh, amongst the Damals. Papua is now part of the largest Muslim country in the whole world. Indonesia. And the island of Java, the size of, uh, the size of uh, North Carolina. North Carolina has 6 million people. Java has 153 million and they're almost all Muslims, and some of them are fanatic Muslims. And they're pouring into Papua. And the Papuans hate them. The Damals don't like them either. I won't say they hate them. But they don't like them. Okay? Jesus is saying to the Damals, you are responsible to be a witness to the Muslims. How is that going to happen? Well, it happens when Muslims come in contact with them and they tell them about Jesus. Let me tell you about one Muslim woman, a Javanese woman uh, living, in, uh, living in Papua and when I'm talk about Muslims, I've got to put on a Muslim prayer hat. When they go to the mosque to pray five times a day, they put on a prayer hat. Uh, now, this Muslim lady was a single mother, uh, and she had a little boy, and the little boy had a hernia and needed an operation. Uh, she had no money for the operation. Her, her next door neighbor was a believer and had told her about Jesus. And she was hearing the gospel for the first time. One night, while she was worried about her little boy and needing an operation and she had no money for it, uh, Jesus appeared to her in a just at night, and a bright light, and there he was. And she said, are you Jesus? And he said, yes. She said, if you heal my son, I will believe in you. And then it was all dark again. The next day, she woke up, and the hernia of that little boy was completely gone. God had healed her, her little boy. And she, faithful to her word, became a believer and follower of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know whether you know, but Muslims sing song the Quran. And she went, she went to the marketplace, and she took the Bible that her 
her uh, neighbor had given her and she took the Bible and she began to sing song the Bible in the marketplace. Well, the Muslim, uh, the, the Muslim priest was furious. He called the police and the police came and got her and took her to the uh, police station and they said, who gave you permission to read that Bible in the marketplace? She said, God did. Who gave you permission to bring me to the police station? They let her go. They have taken her three times to the police station when the, when the Muslim priest turns her in. But she keeps uh, sing-songing the, the Bible in the marketplace. She is not only a follower of Jesus, she is a witness to who Jesus is. Now, I... I think that uh, there's one more priority that I haven't mentioned. So I said there were three priorities. There's one more. And that is uh, the next verse, verses uh, 10 and 11. If we can have those on the overhead, verses 10 and 11. All right. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Verse 11. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The fourth priority is to believe that Jesus will come again. And we live in hope yes. of his yes. soon coming. Now, uh, I want to remind you about Matthew 24, verse 14. Because Matthew 24, verse 14, ties the coming of Jesus and being a witness together in a very important way. Uh, All right. Uh, if we can have Matthew twenty four fourteen. I I'm sorry. Let me read it to you. Oh, we've got it? Okay. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Matthew ties our witness together with the coming of Christ. So, if we are faithful witnesses, it will, the gospel will be preached to the whole world. And then Jesus will come. Let us be faithful in our witness to bring back the king. Bringing back the king. Now, in conclusion here, uh, I want to ask you, what does this mean to you? And what does it mean to me? We now know what it meant for the Damals. It was their gateway to know Jesus, who is the doorway into heaven. And to the end of all of their fear. But for us, uh, there are some very important things in this passage. And the first question I want to say is, are we putting the kingdom of God first in our lives? Do we
focus on his kingdom instead of the kingdom of this world. It's so easy to get tied up with this world things and forget the priority of his kingdom. And then question number two is, are we being intentional about witness, witnessing to people? Uh, two days ago after prayer here at the church, I, I was impressed. We went out to get some uh, tacos and uh, I was impressed. Cindy uh, got the tacos, paid the bill, and then she said to the clerk, uh, do you have a good church? And invited the clerk to come to Liberty Life Center. Uh, I was impressed. That was good. Uh, when I see these Caribbean guys going by while well, we're on a walk, uh, I say to them as they pass, uh, Benediciones de Dios. And they usually look at me and say, God bless you too, in English. <laughs> but sometimes it opens the doorway to talk about Jesus. Take every opportunity to witness, be a witness. And I want to say the core of this whole passage is, are you filled with the Spirit of God? Uh, and are you, is what you do, does it come out of your power or does it come out of spirit power? Because he says, don't do anything in your power. What you do, do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And especially to the youth, I want to ask. Um, well, no, I want to ask all of you, uh, are you, are you involved in, in reaching the whole world? Now, I know some of you go uh, on mission trips to Latin America and to other places. That's wonderful. Praise God. Uh, that will help you see what needs to be prayed for and what needs to be encouraged. For the young people here, I want to ask, is God calling you to be a witness? Maybe in another country, to another people. The Spirit of God is calling people to be involved. And we need to be listening for his voice. Uh, I want to mention here that God is asking us to go back to Papua uh, to finish the translation of the Old Testament. It's almost finished. The shorter Old Testament, and you'll see the shorter Old Testament up here, that's 40% of the, you, maybe you've never heard of the shorter Old Testament. Uh, the United Bible Societies and Wycliffe Bible Translators have agreed together on chapters from each of the books of the Old Testament that carry the story line of the Old Testament. Yeah. Now, you don't translate the genealogies and those kind of things, but it's about 40%. There's a 50% model, too. Um, if you translate that first, they get the story of the Old Testament maybe 20 years before they'd get it otherwise. The shorter Old Testament has been published and has been in their hands for 15 years. Now they need the rest of the Old Testament. We're going back to finish it up. And we believe the translators are working on it while we're here. And we appreciate that you can pray for us and that you will be praying for us. And we ask you to please pray for the Damals and pray for the translation of the scriptures. There are four translators that are working on it right now. And they're finishing the uh, last 
uh, chapters that have that are yet to be done. And uh, when we get there, we will do the work of a consultant and do the checking and ask the Bible Society, the Indonesian Bible Society, to print it. We appreciate your prayers and uh, the opportunity to worship with you and be part of your wonderful family here. Praise God. Pray for the Damals and pray for the Bible translation. And we pray for you that God will fill you with the Spirit and make you uh, witnesses here, there, and to the ends of the earth so that we can bring back the King. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and kindness to the Damal people that they heard of you and wanted to follow Jesus. We pray that you will be with them and help them to evangelize their neighbors. Help us, Lord, to be followers of Jesus that live in the power of the Holy Spirit and are followers of the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world. Lord, I pray your blessing upon each one here and thank you for their desire to pray for us as we return. I pray that you will pour out your blessing upon them, upon us, and upon the Damal people. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So how many of you enjoyed that? Thank you, Jesus. We're, we are blessed to be with, um, with people who have actually gone out there and done what they have been able to achieve with the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, I think that we need to bless them. What do you think? Yeah. So um, we are going to give you an offering. And you can use it however you want to. I know that we trust you. <laughs> We see the Jesus in you, and we trust you. We know that you'll put it to wherever it needs to be done. And so we're sowing into you and into Indonesia, and it is a privilege for us to do so. So um, ushers, uh, get ready. Make out your checks to Liberty, but make sure if you put it in an envelope and you put it on there for you could either say, what just put Brother John, and we'll know that it's for him. If you do it on our app, it, oh gosh, if you do it on the app, what's the name of our app? I ask this every time. Easy Tithe. Easy Tithe. Easy Tithe. It's John Ellenberger Christian Missionary Alliance. Now you'll remember it. Okay, so um, you can do that instantly if you do it on your app. Um, and so let, let's pray over this. Father God, we thank you for the privilege and the honor of giving right now, Lord, to missionaries that have lived their life abandoned to you for the sake of other people hearing the truth. And so, Lord, we, we thank you that as we sow our seed, our harvest that we want is that we too will be these witnesses that were spoken about today. Father, I ask that there would be an evangelistic spirit that will come in this house. And Lord, as we sow the seed, we are putting our faith and engaging in that, that we will be soul winners um, here and everywhere. Lord, I pray that we would answer your call wherever you call us to, whatever you ask us to do, Lord. We want our answer to be yes and amen. And so, Father God, we sow this into other nations on purpose, other tribes on purpose, as an answer to your heart's cry. And Lord, we believe it is coming back to us right here at Liberty that we will obey you and spread it to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Okay, ushers, wait on the people. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, bless you, Lord. You know, when you get around somebody who is anointed in um, a certain area, then you can receive from that spirit as well. And so I hope you're pulling on it. And so are these books from there? Are these all Bibles from there? What do we have here? Those were Bibles. Um, uh, there's some pictures and uh, some articles about the book. Okay, so there's articles, there's pictures, and there's Bibles up here. So, yeah, you should look at that and, and make sure that you love these people and hug on them. We get to be with them a little bit longer. We're going to take every advantage of that. And we believe that you will finish quickly. Amen. Amen. And we'll be praying for you. All right. End of June, they said. Is that true? <laughs> That's what it looks like right now, end of June. Yeah. We'd like to keep them in our pockets, but we know they have a mission. They have a mission. So we got to do what we've got to do, right? All right. Father God, as we give, Lord, we declare today that we are receiving that evangelistic anointing, Lord, that we are going to hear your voice and obey it and be willing to lay our lives down too for the sake of the gospel and bring back the king. Thank you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Everybody say, come. come. Lord Jesus, come. Yeah, amen. We, we, we're ready to go, but what about the ones that aren't? We're going to make sure that they are before we leave here, right? Amen. Amen. All right, I love you. But who do we love the most? And who loves us the most? And who loves them the most? All right, go spread the gospel.